Hey guys, welcome to Historical Podcast. This week is going to be a pretty awesome week since we're covering one of the greatest rivalries in Ireland, and that is the rivalship between the Fitzgeralds and the Butlers, one of the greatest rivalship in medieval history. And as always, we have Michael from Clans and Dynasties. And to cover this amazing topic, we have Rude Butler. <laughs> Hopefully we can... Uh, Fucking edit that back. <laughs> Real Butler. <laughs> right. Yeah. Real Real Butler. I, I can't believe I can't Get believe that vastly deep. Uh, I just can't believe that it takes um, you know two two people here to correct another Irishman on how to speak Irish. <laughs> I've been speak. I, I've been trying to speak Japanese all week, and literally, I was coming up to it, and my brain just went, "Arigato zaimas, kumbawa." <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, so uh, welcome, Rue, and uh, good to see you again. Very much. So, yeah, um, my sort of favorite sort of thing here would be, you know, the clans and the dynasties fighting fighting each other out. (laughs) See what I did there? Put that in there. (laughs) Um, Uh, uh, Always be selling. Yeah, always be selling, exactly. But, uh, no, this is definitely a a great topic for us to be covering today. Um, And I think, you know, the, the butlers and the Geraldines are definitely... If there ever was, other clans had rivalries that waxed and waned throughout. But I, I feel politically, the and sort of in the circumstances of what they were to lose and gain and the tactics used by Irish families wasn't the same as what the Geraldines and the Butlers would lose or gain politically or with land and, you know, possessions and stuff. So they really, when they were, this was a, this was, this was high stakes poker these two families were playing, you know, proper professional level, whereas the Irish clans and families, for the most part, it would wax and wean, you get families like O'Brien's and stuff coming through, but for the most part, they were playing professional big stakes poker against each other, um, which is why I think it's so interesting. So, you know, it draws you in and hopefully, yeah, we'll be bringing you in with us. So uh, I think uh, a little bit of context, maybe just only a little brief, uh, history of uh, these families um, and then we can sort of start getting down to the nitty gritty and, and uh, backstabbing and, and all that good stuff. <laughs> so uh, Rua, I'll, I'll, this is your sort of expertise with um, you know, right, right, you have, right. you've written three books on the subject pretty much uh, <laughs> so uh, I would expect <laughs> we will be putting links below, great reads um, that uh, you know on basically the the Normans arriving to Ireland. So if we want to start a wee bit of context, I'll uh, Oof, I'll give yeah. you. Um, in fact, I'll tell you what. I'll give Philip the introduction of the Fitzgeralds, and then when you you can come across slightly afterwards, like <laughs> slightly <laughs> afterwards, fifteen years. <laughs> so on you go, Philip. Lead the charge. Look, he had actually just finished reading this one. Oh, this doesn't fall on top of my head. Great little book on this subject. Um, <laughs> the Geraldines and Medieval Ireland, The Making of the Myth. Um, fantastic book, actually. Uh, we will put the link below. Uh, and with the power of editing, maybe we can put the uh, picture up below. But um, the foundation of the Fitzgerald is a quite interesting one. Um, they themselves had actually completely re-edited their own history going into the 1400s. Um, they were supposedly, a lot of historians do argue that they were originally were a Viking family that had settled up in the north of France. But of course, the Geraldines didn't like that and would go off and edited that because by the 1400s and the 1500s and going into the 1600s, being a Viking looking back in all that whole period was seen as a very barbaric thing. So the Fitzgeralds would, in the 1400s, go back and re-edit all of that, and they would change themselves into a Florence family from Italy. And they would actually send diplomats over to Florence in Italy to go and find a family member that they could link themselves with. And they happened to find a Fitzgerald link in Italy that would link them to it, that they were completely related to. So... It is quite interesting from the very start that the Fitzgeralds are getting involved with that kind of, mm, how we say, geology, politics, that the O'Briens and the um, O'Brien's, 
<laughs> especially the O'Briens had already been a part of it. Because it wasn't the, uh, Michael could confirm this, it was the O'Briens that had actually connected themselves to the O'Neills as well, hadn't they? With yeah. uh, Nile and the Nile, Nile, Nile hostages. hostages. Yeah, it seemed to be, mm. um, obviously, oral history and written history of Ireland's, uh, you know, clown histories and genealogies were pretty well recorded. But there was that grey area of, you know, uh, the, the, the one true high king of Ireland, Nile, uh, and, and his family, you know, his uh, genealogy. So um, of those ancient first high kings of Ireland. So that seemed to be the focal point. It was it was uh, much easier for families to claim that sort of genetic link back to the fifth century, rather harder for mm. the butlers to do it, you know, to a family in the, in the, in the 13th and 12th century. So, um yeah, the, that it was a, it was a to do thing, um, uh, which is why they often say that modern genealogy um, and genetics prove that most of the annals genealogies are correct in our family histories. Mm. Well, up until you get to the you know fifth and sixth century, then it starts to get a bit grey because <laughs> uh, and yeah, the O'Briens. It, it was a but it's the same uh, same reason. I'm sure the Geraldines did it as well. Not so much for their land ownership, but it was more to do with legitimacy. Um, especially in Ireland, sort of, you know, everything mm. was about that paternal link to whether you could rule mm. Ireland or not. Um, uh, but uh, they never really changed that, and, and they went all the way through. I mean, with the Geraldines, it's almost like, and other families, it would almost be like a fashionable one year to be Italian, fashionable the next year to be Viking, fashionable, and they would change as mm. they go along, you know, as they go, go along. So, uh, yeah, uh, it is just that sort of, it happens all the time, and, and yet we fall into yeah. the same trap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because then, um, as the because the part that they had re-edited is the fact that the Vikings had settled in the north of France. The way the Fitzgeralds wanted to retell it was that they had gone, they had happened to bump into William the Conqueror and stuff as they were going over to the Battle of Hastings, and because it was just a noble thing to do, because. William the Conqueror had justified his invasion of England with the backing of the Pope. So that was a noble thing to do, was to join William the Conqueror and take back um, England from the person Savages. who denied it from William. Yeah, person who had denied it from William the Conqueror, God's right. And so William the Conqueror had gone over, he had taken over England. And I think Michael had made a very good point in one of our previous videos in that the Fitzgeralds were barely even in England and they had quickly immigrated over to Wales, onto the south of Wales, didn't they, Michael? Well, yeah, again, we will be able to uh, put in his start here, but yeah, they effectively became martial lords, which uh, martial lords, which I would dispute whether they, that counts them as part of the kingdom or not. <laughs> you know, it depends on how mm. you can uh, justify how much power the king had and how much that relates to, you know, whether that relates to actually being in charge of these families because they were effectively independent um in all but name um and mm. uh, yeah they, they they were along the borders and, and moved to south south wales and um with the typical norman uh, aggression and advancement <laughs> they, they moved quickly into those areas <laughs> But yeah, energy and ability actually, Michael. Energy, you know, and ability. energy and ability. Is that, is that the new? Is that the new PC way of saying it? <laughs> the, yeah, but the, I mean, I, I like speed and aggression in a military term. You know, speed and aggression. They mm. swept through. Yeah, but they weren't there long at all before they had their eyes set on another, on another, uh, you know, excursion, shall we say, to to mm. far distant lands and. Um, yeah, because it, it's always funny. Me and Michael have talked about this before. Um, it's grand labeling a lot of the families on the east side of Ireland as Anglo-Norman. But it gets a bit weird when you're branding, especially Desmond Fitzgeralds as Anglo-Norman, um, just because they're not in England for very long. And then they're quickly in Ireland. And then about the 1400s and so, you see the Fitzgeralds, as we're going to talk about later on, we'll get into more better detail and stuff. But later on, the Desmond Fitzgeralds become very Gaelicized. And then it, you can kind of debate, are they more Hiberno-Norman or are they more Anglo-Norman? I don't know what your views you guys have on that topic, but yeah. I always kind of look at them as more kind of Hiberno-Norman rather than Anglo-Norman. But we'll, we'll talk about it it's later a, on. 
Yeah, it's a waxing and waning one for me because I would always refer to the Barrys and the Condons and the Fitzgeralds as Cambro Norman, i.e., they're from well, they're Wales. There's a Wales connection, oh, and, it's yeah. just, and for that Cambro Normans, I have this idea of this kind of nearly independent uh, mind, you know, mindset where they don't, they don't, they maybe have to tip their cap to the king, but don't really want to, and they don't want the interference, and they're, they're nearly their whole push is to maintain their independence and their particular rights over a territory and when they come to ireland obviously the fitzgerald they conquer pretty widely pretty quickly <clears throat> and get wexford town and a year later strongbow arrives and that's grand because strongbow goes for waterford and dublin and they all they're all happy you know everybody seems to be working pretty well maybe they're already thinking about who's going they're going to backstab next but who knows um but then in 1171, the king comes over and immediately robs the Fitzgeralds of their lands in Wexford, takes it for his own. He takes Dublin and Waterford off oh, yeah. Strongbow and gives Strongbow the, uh, the, the lordship of Leinster. And mm. through wheeling, wheeler dealing and um, a bit of uh, a few marriages, uh, you know, advantageous. And again, through sheer bloody will, the Fitzgeralds actually, again, win a, basically another uh Patrimony, their eldest son of Morris, who came to uh, Ireland in the 1170, he, his eldest son, Gerald, sorry, second son, Gerald, uh, gets part of um, Offaly. Uh, he later inherits part of uh, Kildare at Nace. And then his set, third son, Thomas, actually wins lands down in, in, uh, in, in what's now Limerick, a place called Shannad, and from there builds what will become major power base uh, with, you know uh, from limerick he you know takes parts of kerry and he takes parts of cork and this huge huge probably the probably the biggest lordship possibly in the history of the british isles if you want to call them that um but it's it's vast it's you know munster is probably about the same size as the netherlands and the fitzgerald earls of desmond own half of it mm. and not just own it control the other half pretty much as well <laughs> So they are a major force uh, territorially but with this independent mindset that we don't want anybody messing with our land. You know, people in Dublin, you just pretty well stay in Dublin. People in England, don't you worry. I've got this sorted. Munster is okay. Mm. Um, on the mm. other hand, the Kildare, they're right beside Dublin, the Kildare Fitzgeralds. They expand from Offaly into Kildare and, and basically take over a, a whole fifth of what, it, what, what was the Lordship of Leinster. And their problems are geography and politics, <laughs> mainly. Uh, territory down in Desmond, geography and politics, uh, because they're right slap bash up against Dublin and the Pale. So they have to be a little bit more uh, politically minded to keep hold of these lands. Their, their lands aren't so big, but they are you know, paramount in them. So it's very interesting that these two different brands of, the, of, of Fitzgeralds, the Desmonds and the Kildares, even though they're coming from you know, they keep on having to rebuild. They keep on having to rebuild, and they do it so effectively. They are nothing but admiration for the Fitzgeralds as a as a tribe. Honestly, they are incredible. Well, we see how quickly. I think one of the um, reasons for these Anglo Cambro Hiberno Norman sort of families to uh, why they succeeded, and obviously we know them militarily and everything like that. At the very start, anyway, they had a tried and tested war machine that they advanced all through Europe with and eventually got to Ireland, massive gains there. But to, the reason they were able to hold it is they unofficially adopted the, uh, you know, polygamy of, uh, you know, <laughs> unlike the families where we see families die off very quickly um, in in England and then um, so sort of Scotland, these families are having one or two children, illegitimate children can't inherit, you know, it's um, so, whereas they didn't, do that in in Ireland. Obviously, they were having these uh, illegitimate children with noble Gaelic family girls, you know, and uh, princesses mm -hmm. and stuff. So to keep those families sort of happy, they were obviously landing these sons um, in the in the Irish way. And uh, so these families were big quickly. You know, it was it was almost like you yeah. know, when you drop that dye in the water and it just sp expands. You know, and it, and it, that's how it, the best way I can, the analogy I can use. Because they spread so quickly, they were having 10, 11 children in some cases. Mm. And uh, these families were landed, but they were also related to the places where they were landed. We see with the Shannon and the Kerry uh, Fitzgeralds, you know, the, um, 
and they were related to the very first ones that we don't know the first might have carried sort of genealogy of his mother's side but there is a, a discussion that it was of a family related to the O'Briens and um, they were part of the same group and they were based in Shannon and he was given land in and around Shannon you know so they mm. these families these sons were Fitzgeralds but their mothers were O'Briens and Driscoll's and yada yada the list goes on and uh, they were based in those areas so they had those maternal links to the Irish families which again gives you that power base to work from when you can talk to your uncle uh Murchad and your uncle you know um you know everything else, all the okay. Irish names you know just oh, you know, Brian's and stuff like that you can fight for your side and your arguments against those other clans who maybe don't agree with the fact that you are you know not an Irish person or in everything but name obviously because these guys were speaking mm. eventually speaking Irish and everything else but um so yeah I think that's a um you know one of the one of the things that sort of solidifies the the fish shows because they really get into it really get into those uh native mm. girls <laughs> just sort of There's start reading chords um you guys really hit with me there as i was um going as you guys were both going into further detail with the Fitzgeralds. and two very important parts is first off um the politics of how these guys go between the two worlds um and that is the on one side you have the english world and on the other side you have the irish world and how the Desmonds and the Fitzgerald, sorry, the Fitzgerald Desmonds and Fitzgerald Kildare have somehow pulled off this trick that goes on for a good while where they were able to go between both the Irish world and the English world and just milk it for the best. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, um, they have a dozen kids. They have loads and loads of children. They, they're not fully affected by English laws, um, although there are parts where the statutes of Kilkenny kick in and it really punishes them to certain degrees. They then manipulate that to get rid of rivals within their own family. So if there's a certain Fitzgerald they want to remove, well, they just have to highlight to the king, oh, well, he's mar- married to a Gaelic woman or he's born out of a Gaelic marriage and are able to just remove him. Um, I can't remember which Fitzgerald. There is a Fitzgerald who's replaced by the Fitzgerald or usurper. Um, yeah. But he literally usurps a previous Fitzgerald because he marries a woman from Buttervent. And because he marries a woman oh, from That's Butterfint, not enough to do that. I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I live next to Buttervent. I fully agree there, Butler. <laughs> but he literally uses the excuse that she's married to a... He's married to a woman from Buttervent, writes a letter to the king, and the king literally says, oh, well, we remove her, um, him so, and that was him out. He got sent back to London, had to be re-educated on what it is to be English, and that was him. The other Fitzgerald, uh, Fitzgerald the usurper, took over, and that was that. The Fitzgeralds literally manipulated, although he himself had Gaelic lovers, he was going between the two to get the best for the opportunity. And that was the same on the other side, where they were literally manipulating Gaelic laws although the Gaelic were completely aware of this. And that's why the Gaelic never fully accepted the Fitzgeralds as one of their own, constantly referring to them as Old English, because they would continuously go back to manipulate and use. So they are, the Gaelic were fully aware that the Fitzgeralds were milking the two systems. And that's why other Gaelic char- tribes would never fully accept the Fitzgeralds as one of their own, because they weren't fully um, taking on their law. And What's the word I am looking for? Um, being, I could say, digested for some reason comes coming into my head, but they weren't fully um, it taken into it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think. And uh, so, no, um, yeah, you, you've hit the nail on the head there. You know, this is the, and this is a, a great summary of of the Fitzgeralds. I'll just to give you an idea of what it was like. But we, mm. I think we we need to start thinking of uh, who else had their eyes set on Ireland, uh, along with their best friend. Um, of noble of uh, royal blood um comes trooping across and uh you know dun, 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 yeah, triumph hey down the carpets start now, spreading the flowers is it is it would it be like a, an image to give the the audience an image of like of a ship and they're on the prow of the ship you know like this and uh with the cape flapping in the wind 
or maybe is it with uh, Prince John and uh, so there's a Titanic and Jack, you know, <laughs> embracing a cigar. <laughs> you know, you so, you uh, can all decide after this, you know, how, whether whether the Prince, whether the butlers earn the right as you know uh, very early on as the conquerors or just political sort of. <laughs> I think you've actually hit exactly the nail on the head. And I think this might be the, the actual start of this feud between these two families or three mm -hmm. families, really. Mm -hmm. um, because I can't imagine how galling it must have been for the Fitzgeralds to have been in Ireland for 15, 16 years, having fought all manner of people who outnumbered them by, you know, 20 to 1, 50 to 1, had conquered Dublin, had it taken off them, had Wexford taken off them, had bled and died and fought and scraped and trade and anything you can imagine to get their hands on some land. And then 15 years later, this little rag of a, a prince comes over with his mates, uh, which is, you know, I have an idea of that kind of the birding, or the, what do you call them, the Burlington Club, you know, there was oh, Boris yeah, Johnson yeah. and David Cameron oh, and all those yeah. guys, the riot, the riot Club, I'm coming over and that's the kind of guys that are coming with him. You've got Prince John, you know, in the lead, the youngest probably. Yeah. Then with him you've got Theobald Walter, or sorry, you've got Will Walter or William de Burgh and uh, Bertram de Verdun and Theobald Walter. And instead of having to fight for anything, uh, Prince John just points at a bit of land here, there, and everywhere and says, "Okay, John Papad, you're going to have Louth. Okay, righto, um, Bertram de Verdun, you're going to have the other bit of Louth." And points to Tipperary and li li uh, Limerick and says, "Right, William de Burgh, that's." part to you and you can have the constabulary of uh, Limerick as well and Theobald Walter you can have everything from Loch Derg to the River Shore in North Tipperary. I can't imagine the gall of a, of a man coming and doing that when I fought and died and my uncles and fathers and cousins have all fought and died for something and he just gets it given to him on a plate mm -hmm. and you know yeah. you don't even speak bloody Irish we've been here for 15 years we've had to learn this language mm -hmm. um I'm talking against the butlers. Is that right? I feel like I'm doing that. <laughs> but humble beginnings, you can, you know, you'll work your way up to because they do achieve some great things later on. But at the start, there, I mean, I mean, if you were, an, I hate to use the term English, much like we use the term Anglo Norman and stuff like that. I mean, these are really Franco English, you know. I mean, these aren't really yeah. English in the in the sense that we we sort of see today. Um, and you know, in the same sense, we don't like to say that these. People are Irish, and, and it's the same with me with being English. But these Anglo families, um, yeah, they, I mean, they, the butlers have achieved uh, along with their um, their uncle, and uh, you know, they achieved great things in England and Scotland. You know, they they weren't nobodies at the same time politically, and you nope. know, they had they were they were rising stars in the English courts in the church. You know, these. Uh, a bit, and they had a foundation of uh, noble, you know, of a noble fam family. They weren't just upstarts in, you know, much like the Bontings Club with the the, the Boris Johnsons. Of these are and uh, Cameron's. These are from long-standing blue-blooded families. You know, um, mm. the cream of the crop, as they would probably uh, prefer. You know, to themselves. themselves. <laughs> so, yeah. So and uh, these are the same butlers. Were no different. So they weren't out of nowhere. Um, so the, I imagine there would have been some sort of degree of um, awareness of the Fitzgeralds to be like, yeah, okay, they are a, a well-known family from Norfolk. And they own large amounts of land in, in the north of England. Their family are well-connected. Um, but at the same time, like you say, it's almost like when the officer comes into the, the army front lines in the, in the trenches, and you've got these grizzled soldiers sort of going, I've been here fighting. And he's going, yes, we're just going to... Mm. Go over the trench. Pop over the top here. Yeah, pop over the top <laughs> here, you know. <laughs> I'm, I feel like getting my boots wet today, you know. <laughs> and it's just like, yeah, I, yeah, I can, I get that imagery <laughs> there. Of, uh, <laughs> you know, he's obviously a tried and tested officer, but he hasn't been on the front line. So I, I like your analogy there about these sort of families here. Um, but like I say, that they, they are a to-do family and they do know what they're about. But typical of the... Uh, royalty at the time and which we would see right up until the Scottish Wars of Independence. Very good at carving up maps before they actually own the land. You know, very good mm. at going, 
you can have all this here and it's like yeah you don't actually own that <laughs> well, what about we, those chaps that are already yeah. there are they going to be a problem is that going to be an issue yeah. or? as we see with the o'briens the the some of the land that yeah. the butlers are awarded is o'brien territory and um yeah they don't really they don't really get a foothold there but the o'briens are very very quick a, a great family um for looking at a, an irish family that uses the english and the and the irish sort of systems um are very quick to sort of say to the butlers yeah this is ours but we'll give you a little bit of something just to keep this quiet um uh, much like the way that the geraldines would say to the english kings later on um but uh yeah so they yeah like you said uh you know, they've come across they've uh and uh you want to talk about the the, yeah. the buildings okay. of well Nina, yeah etc so the father of the Butler family is Theobald Walter. We've uh, talked about him before. Mm-hmm. He is given this name, this title, Hereditary Chief Butler of Ireland, uh, to be a kind of functionary for the English court. Basically, he's there to um, make sure that when the King of England comes to comes to Ireland, and they presumed in those days that it was going to be a pretty common thing, that he would be supplied with wine uh, by the Butler family. Uh, as it turned out, that never really happened, but it's that's that's neither here nor there. Um, the Butlers, they start off in North uh, Tipperary at um, Nina and then sort of have another base over in Arklow in Wicklow and a, a third one in Garwin in Kilkenny. Uh, they quickly uh, sort of build up quite a bit of power through advantageous marriages, really, but um, they are... Uh, they, they're always marrying in. I mean, the butlers, unfortunately, the first generation, there's only one son. The second generation, there's only one s- son who adopts the name Butler. So they're not a bit like the Fitzgeralds are kind of going in every direction because they arrive with, you know, upwards of seven sons. I think it's seven sons of Morris Fitzgerald. So there's loads of Fitzgeralds even at the very start. There's a huge extended family. The butlers come and there's Theobald Walter. He's actually quite an older guy when he arrives, he marries and dies when his son is still a kid. Uh, Theobald the second butler dies when he's 30, having had two sons, one of which uh, adopts the surname de Verdun and goes off to Meath. Uh, the third butler dies when he's in his only he's only in his late twenties. So there's not, you know, there's not much um what's the word I'm looking for? There's not much continuation of the line. It's always having to rebuild, rebuild, rebuild. So the early butlers, whilst they are considered pretty important because of this court position that they hold, you know, on a hereditary basis, they're not not majorly powerful, I would say. I, I don't think they're as, you know, as powerful in these early days as, for, for one, the Burks, who very quickly become a major force in Connacht and then a major force in Ulster. They're not as powerful as the De Lacy's, who are the major force in Meath. In, um, obviously, Strongbow dies in 1176, and his lands are kind of uh, adopted uh, or taken over by the Marshall family. So they're not as powerful as the Marshalls over in Leinster. They are maybe not even second-rate family in the grand scheme of things. They're probably even further down the pecking order than that. Up from acorns come great oaks and all that. <laughs> and they managed to, <laughs> as unlikely as it sounded when they came to Ireland, they, they, their best thing is that they managed to survive <laughs> and push into the, the 13th and 14th century and actually are still, are still running, up and running, because the Marshalls fall away, the De Lacy's fall away, the Burks, yeah, they get into the 14th century, but, well, we'll maybe come to that in a little bit, but they, too, eventually fall away slightly. So the Sheralds, through sheer uh, Royden, get to survive. The Butlers just the white hold on and uh, move into the the, the, 12, or the, the 13th century, uh, now in control of Tipperary and parts of the Lordship of Leinster. Um, what else to say about the Butlers? Yeah, well, like I mean, a drink. you've... you've, you've hit the nail on the head there they, they are they have slow beginnings but when it comes to sort of uh Fitzwater's great-grandson um they start to sort of marry into the Irish I mean they traditionally married into English families or uh, Anglo families mm-hmm. but they started to marry into families that had connections I mean we have the it was the the, the Burr link there that I'm referring to but they had relations to Irish families so they started to get more integrated into sort of the politics of the, those sort of family, you know. Uh, but also, they but they traditionally stayed more 
Anglo, but these felt they but they still mm. had those illegitimate sons eventually, you know, those illegitimate lines. Yeah. Um and uh not I would say to the degree of the, the Geraldines, like, but they do branch out and they do start to but I think one of the things that we have to be aware of is that the the butler's territory was very very useful for them because they were very central their holdings were very centralized not only were mm. the geraldines had land here land there land there um and they were surrounded by the mccarthy's and the sullivan's and and uh you know they had these families hitting them from all sides the butlers were very central in in uh, ireland their holdings were very centralized not only that they were walking into territory like you said before that had pretty much been sort of subjugated already it was you know it was um these families like the um uh uh i'm just trying to think about actually some of the families that were in the area of uh ossery and stuff of you know the whole list off my head but oh, these, uh, Fitzpatrick and that's yeah fitzpatrick I, uh -huh. I couldn't get fitzgerald on my head um so we had the fitzpatrick's who'd sort of been pushed away the orions who were in the i drone area had sort of been pushed away um you know, these, as well. yeah the, all of them all these they diver migrated further to the uh, breaches of the Butler territory, or they just sort of stayed and become sort of, you know, subjects and just willing subjects, as it were. Um, uh, until you start to get to the O'Connor Feelys later on, who decide to start, you know, being a bit more uh, <laughs> rebellious, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, the, you know, the, but they were, they were very lucky. Yes, they were small farms, but very lucky of where they were placed. Um, they had a good map placement there. Um, but yeah, like you say, so the 13th, um, 1300s, 14th century, um, they're, they're now more stable in there. They've become quite wealthy because of uh, the coming botanier, you know, the holders of the wine. Um, they started to be given, they've been given stipends and uh, titles galore. And uh, I imagine the Fitzgeralds, I mean, these are doing well at the time as well. They're, they're sort of, waxing and weaning a wee bit, but they're holding their own. Um, their their family's well spread. Um, they're pushing into, they're now starting to sort of uh, push the McCarthy's a bit more, uh, trying to encroach further south. Um, so I think, you know, but as with everything that happened in Ireland, these families, most of their problems didn't come from Ireland. They came from England. <laughs> and the troubles that were mm -hmm. happening over there. <laughs> Not always the case, yeah. the old English problem. Yeah. <laughs> so it is a continual problem that they're trying to balance. As, as Philip says, they're trying to balance this uh, being of the Gaelic world with being uh, still linked to the, uh, the, the English world. It is a balancing act that they struggle with for... <laughs> 500 years really um and how you do it it is mind-boggling how you balance these two things i mean yeah. what i love about you know brehon law is the fact that it's very fair dinkum you know it's, it's it seems to me to be a fair you know no matter what part of the society you're in it's it's fair dinkum you know mm. you got caught pay up yeah. um whereas english law mm. it seems a little bit more if you have power you can get away with things so you know the normans aren't mugs They're these uh families the fitzgeralds and the butlers aren't mugs when they need to use Brehon law, they'll use Brehon law because they know that that is something that is mm. fair-minded. Maybe not, not the way to say it, but it, it, mm. it feels fair. When they need to, they'll go to the, the courts in England and say, well, here, I don't know what's happening. I just can't understand how I don't get accused of murder more often. And it is, you know, they, they do play the game really, really well. And I'm not going to mm. say the name of a certain TV show in this instance, but it is... Um, in the background of all this, of course, um, you know, I, I see that, I think, I've, again, I've said this before, but the eldest son of every family of these families, the Fitzgeralds of Desmond, Kildare and, and the Butlers, the eldest son is nearly always marrying into a Anglo-Irish or an English yeah. family to maintain yeah. that link to England. Mm. On the other mm. hand, the second son is always is nearly always and uniquely marrying into, uniquely, ultimately marrying into Gaelic families and getting yeah. that link to them as well. The difference, of course, is that in the Desmond family, very early on, the title of Earl of Desmond, the headship of the family, is inherited by one of these cadet families. So Gerald, the third Earl of Desmond, his wife is an O'Brien, I think. Yeah, she is. Wrong there. But yeah, so he's marrying into a Gaelic dynasty, and therefore his children mm. would always have a, a, a greater link to that. 
it takes many, many, many generations for the butlers to, you know, we're talking in the 1500s, sorry, 1400s, when a junior branch of the family, the McRichard butlers, yeah. uh, when they, they, they are very heavily Gaelicized and takes it, you know, we're talking in the 1400s, that they come to the headship of the family, even the 1500s. Mm -hmm. And mm. actually, the Kildare Fitzgeralds, they don't, they never, you know, until really late on. I think what one of the people that Philip was talking about was one of the, I think it was the seventh Earl of Kildare, he does marry into a, one of the Amours of Leash. And he repudiates his, his, his children by that marriage and takes an English wife so that his, or an Anglo-Irish wife, so that his, his, his younger children are, you know, given the title rather than this, you know, quasi Gaelicized son of his. And I mean, and that's something I don't think is, is, is said enough because there's always this kind of idea that, oh, no, no, the Fitzgeralds are really there. Oh, they're, they may as well be more Irish. They may as well be Irish themselves. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, it, it's, it's just not the case. In the case of the Desmond, uh, Desmond Fitzgeralds, a bit more. In the case of Kildare's, no, they are, you know, Irish speaking, yes. Very much invested in Ireland, yes. But their mm -hmm. heritage is all, ultimately from England and the Anglo-Irish world. Yep. So it's... Um, no, uh, it's one of these ones where it's, it's comp very complicated as well. well this is yeah. Because we're but, um, talking about many family lines here, all with varying mm. degrees apart, and especially in the case of the Fitzgeralds, where you have the Kildare, the Desmonds, but then even the sub branches of those families, like the Kerry, the you know the Knights of Kerry, and uh, yeah. the, well, the famous Black Green and uh, White Knight is it? Um, it's lines, yeah. yeah so the of Glen and stuff. So these families have sub-levels of very dominant mm. families who again are jostling around and, and taking part in this politics and it's very hard to sort of bring it down into saying butler and fitzgerald um mm. and you know the and not only that you have sort of varying degrees i mean we would learn we see later on in in the 13th and 14th century that there would be fitzgeralds within the butler territories landowners um not prominent families not these are mid-level sort of landed gentry um mm -hmm. and uh we see they exist and they're in for their own own their own vassalage or their vassals, vassals of, yeah, the yeah. vassals of butlers so you know it, it's never just black and white you know like my mm. family's a butler my family's a fitzgerald and they hate each other but there were yeah. well, certain lines that didn't and there were certain lines that you know and never mind that these families intermarried you know, we talk about their relationship with the fact that they married Gaelic families and they married other anglo normal families, but these families married each other, you know, quite a lot. There is a, a lot of links between these two families. Certainly <laughs> <actually. laughs> so, the thing is, is that, um, sorry for putting in there, no, Michael, but no. the thing is, and we've said this like a thousand times over, is that if you're looking at this subject and you're if you've gone this far into the podcast and you're looking at it from a nationalist point of view, you are probably so confused right now, grinding your teeth, meaning they're all English. And that's the thing. If you don't, if you, you, you have to take off your uh, nationalist cap or your modern thinking cap and you have to put it to the side and you have to put on your medieval cap because if you don't put your medieval cap on, you're either going to be very frustratingly confused or you're just going to like just give up now, <laughs> you know, put the whole thing down because it is. Even from a medieval point of view, I guarantee there's probably a lot of, uh, I guarantee a lot of European medievalists are probably watching this now going, wow, Ireland is a confusing mess. And yeah, even for Irish people, uh, Michael has spent hours and hours and hours. I mean, I've looked at uh, Michael's work, even the stuff he posts up on YouTube, and it's doctorate level. And I, I every time Michael, we'd be chilled out and be just talking before we start up a podcast. And Michael's brain, he spits out, uh, PhD level of content and it is confusing and even Michael who's trying to put this all together in his brain finds this confusing so it is a lot to take on but you have to as we continue this little journey keep your medieval caps nice and tied on because you're dealing with families and that's why it is very difficult to argue as we start off at the start of the show with are they more Anglo-Norman are they more you know uh, Hiberno-Norman you know <laughs> it is confusing and it is it, it it's fun to it, talk about but it is fun. very confusing yeah. well, I think I can't uh, stop picturing 
Philip in a nice medieval hat with a feather. No, I, I can't stop seeing it. Nice. <laughs> I'll have to start wearing I'll medieval a attire. Now hat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm in mean, quick change, you know, like uh, Britain's got talent, those quick changers, you know, like, uh, as the years go by. Um, there is actually mm. someone that would like us to cover stuff about medieval clothing, but that's by the by. Uh, yeah, so we'll uh, grip her back in. Uh, Scottish Wars of Independence, I think, is a good place to sort of um, yeah. we start to bring it in. Um, we obviously I just make one, one yes. wee point before we do this, because, you know, the feuds between the butlers and them, we should talk about feuds, I suppose. Mm. I mean, we're going to have yeah. to. <laughs> but the, um, the, uh, the, the, it literally sounds like these guys were at each other all the time. At every point where there is a real threat to either the kingdom or the lordship of Ireland, these families are so easy uh, about putting aside their, their differences and going and actually grouping together. When the Marshall family rebelled in the 1230s, the Burks and the Fitzgeralds were together, uh, you know, defeating the third Earl of uh, Pembroke in, at the, mm. the Curra, the Battle of the Curra. They just put aside their, their differences and went for it. Um, the... Um, but within you know sixty years, the, the the Burks and the Fitzgeralds are having one of the greatest feuds that Ireland has ever seen. Mm. Very little talked about, uh, which results basically in them swapping castles in each other's territories, and it sorts it out. But you know, they, so these these families in the twelve nineties, the Burks and the Fitzgeralds are at each other like you wouldn't believe. The Butlers again have have sort of stabilised there now. We're going into the fourteenth century, and there they've got more uh, into the, the the sort of the the, the, the government. Uh, mechanism in Dublin, they're starting to become more mm. and more involved in that. And so uh, I can't even remember, but the head of the family, Edmund Butler, going into the 1310s, mm. is the Justiciar of Ireland, who, which is pretty much your your, your prime minister role. And um, I, I suppose 1315 yep. is the is a year is a big stop for us now. Yeah, so well, I mean, like you said, this uh, the point is, um, yeah, we come into the Scottish War of Independence, which the Butlers would have a massive sort of impact into, you know, this is the, the late 13th century, uh, early 14th century. So uh, it'd have a massive sort of impact in in this, I don't know if you want to class it as a field uh, for the English or, or, or not. I mean, but they do. So they are holding, like I said, the prime minister position at the time. Um, but whenever 1315 comes across and Edward de Bruce sort of invades Ireland, um, the butlers are there to meet him. Um, but we do see that field that eventually after three campaigns in, in uh, Ireland from Edward, the Battle of Falkirk, he's eradicated. And the butlers are one of the families they're leading the charge against. Now, I wouldn't say it's a glorious victory for the butlers. I mean, there was only about 2,000 uh, Gaelic forces there against like 20,000. And it was more Edward's, um, well, there's a debate on to whether it was his own stupidity or own valour or he'd gone mad. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that sort of, but, you know, with the, with that sort of end of that rebellion or invasion, whatever you want to call it, the butlers are, you know, they, they've got a bit of bragging rights there now, but they, they are straight back into one on one with the Fitzgeralds, like you Actualism. said, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. The one thing I was, I was going to reiterate with you, I was going to say exactly the thing as you. They literally were together against this this threat. The minute it stops, they're back at each other, they're and uh, each other. yeah, it and and, and oh, so certain things they start to see that they're starting to give in. Uh, they're given the uh, palatine rights of Tipperary, yeah, uh, and mm. the, the Desmonds also have palatine rights of their areas as well. Now the thing is through marriage and through everything else, the Fitzgerald start to gain land in Butler territory. And as this goes on, Butlers then start to go, well, hang on a minute. If you own land here, you abide by what I say in this area. Much oh. like the Hundred Year War, where we could see that um, the English kings were kings of England, but dukes of uh, Aquitaine and Normandy, and they were held to account in courts of French courts as the Duke of, because they owned, they were, vassals of the of the king of france through their yeah. lands in france and it very much the butlers tried to sort of justify their sort of things and be like ah oh, fitzgerald needs to come here and lick my boots because oh, i've got all my vassals doing it and uh, the fitzgeralds were kind of like no <laughs> uh, I, I am i am a lord of my own right <laughs> we are equals yeah. the best you know um 
so yeah, uh, we start to see the, like you say, with the government in Dublin sort of building up there, we start to see English laws coming in. We start to see these sort of things impact in the way the feud is started. To break. It's starting to turn from tribalism, factionalism of land and, and raids and counter raids and very Gaelicized mm. in, in that way. Well, Normans would, would do it too. Um, and it started to turn more politics and using the law and, you know, but this is only the foundations of it. It won't really sort of take off until much later, until Henry the Seventh, sort of, um, because before that we have the War of the Roses, which I think yeah. is... Let's, let's, <laughs> do, let's put, put, put a bit in there. I'd like right. to hear, so we're obviously, we've got a man of Cork here. So he's going to be maybe representing the Desmonds. Uh, so I'd like to hear him say a Shanna de Boo for, for the Desmonds there. <laughs> you can say I don't know, it sounds a bit corny now if I was to suddenly say that, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, definitely. <laughs> mm. and we'll, we'll get a, a, the, our, our representative on behalf of the Kildares, who yeah. is obviously from, from a little bit more north, but, um, you know, Doyles are from that neck of the woods as well. So uh, so he's going to give us a Chroma Boo. <laughs> a Chroma Boo. <laughs> I don't care, go. corny away. And uh, Butler, go on then. I want to hear the Butler. Uh, well, I just uh, have a glass of wine and a glass <laughs> and, uh, and say, Comme je trouve. What do you, do you say? <laughs> Comme je trouve. Oh. Ooh. As I find it. As I find it, yes. <laughs> so, yes, uh, we have the... Um, well, I'm going to be a bit more impartial than than than, than jumping on the, the Kildare <laughs> bandwagon. Um, but uh, yes, they yeah they have these, these three Wars factions. of the Roses. War of the Roses. I love it. I, it's actually my favorite war. <laughs> it's different. <laughs> war. Yeah, it actually is. It, you you can't get any like more Star Wars, feudalist man. than War of the War Roses. It is. It, it's the best feudalist war, and it's very much War of the Roses in Ireland is barely ever touched. Compared to England, England loves the War of the Roses. It's plastered everywhere. And <laughs> in Ireland, we never really touch it, although it's where the proper Gaelic Ireland really comes out, especially with the Fitzgerald and all their gallow glass and everything. Uh, what, what's that famous battle there, Michael? The one in uh, Piltown, isn't Piltown, it? Piltown, yeah. Well, well that'd be the, the uh, deciding battle, basically, who would, uh, you know, it uh, it's really is just a uh, stomping and... Uh, mm. <laughs> by the by the Fitzgeralds to the butlers um yeah but yes i mean yeah i'm trying to, i i i'm kind of feel like i should defend the butlers and i'm I, I sort of I sort of given exact how this all came about that yeah. we ended up Lancaster because for the most part um the fourth earl of ormond james the white uh, butler presumably because he was blonde haired or something mm. uh he um he was actually balanced a lot of things he was pretty much the most powerful guy in ireland mm. at the time he was the he had so many times he had had the uh, the Lord Deputy ship and things. He was he had lots of lands in England, lots of lands in Ireland. He actually sent his sons. He was one of the first, I think, to really to send his sons to England to the Royal Court of England. Pretty novel idea mm. because up to that point, most people were saying, "No, I'll keep my sons here. I don't want them over there, man. They're, they need to be here to control our major lands." But he was quite a novel mm. thought. He sent them over to the Lancastrian Court of Henry the Fourth. And they lived at head with you know fought alongside Henry V. The Butlers, through that kind of more you know favourite, they, they they were they, well, I'm trying to think of what the the, the term is, but they're sort of trying to make themselves into favourites. So beyond political power, beyond territorial power, there is the the power derived from being a court favourite, a favourite of the king. And the Butlers seem to be the first ones to go. Oh man, that's a great way to do it. Just be popular and pretty. You'll be fine. <laughs> and um, so they send uh, their three sons, the three sons of the fourth Earl of Ormond, over to England. Even then, they're still balancing. They're, they they fight alongside the Somersets, the Beaufort family, who are the main sort of uh, Lancastrian family. And they also fight and serve under the Dukes of York, which are the, the obviously the Yorkist mm. side of things. So they're very, very, they're trying to balance the power you know, trying to stay as, as, as popular with everybody as they possibly can. It's only very late in the day, in the 1440s, that the uh, the the eldest son of the fourth Earl actually commits to the Lancastrian cause and is created Earl of Wiltshire. So again, another kind of novel thing for an Irishman to be given an English title. So he must have been mm. pretty pretty important to these uh, to the Lancastrian court. And obviously, Henry the Sixth is a bit sort of mentally frail, let's say. So he's in with uh, Henry VI's wife, Queen Margaret, who is a 
superstar of the medieval world in my mm. in my view. Mm. But gender and the gender politics of the day really count against her. But that's life. And so the butlers through the 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 first Earl of Wiltshire, who would later become the fifth Earl, that's how they become a Lancastrian family. And they're pretty high up in the in the Lancastrian sort of uh, you know things uh, to, uh, side of things. They fifth Earl, the first Earl of Wiltshire, he he actually marries the daughter of one of the Dukes of Somerset. This Beaufort family who are the main problem mm. uh, for the mm. for England at the time. Um, so they're very they're, they've go having tried to balance the you know their their sort of uh, political uh, support for both York and Lancaster are now very much in the Lancastrian side of things. Um, mm. I, I suppose that's that's how... The... It really didn't help our side, the Fitzgerald side, because when you guys are all doing this, especially during the War of the Roses, making contacts with England and stuff, the Fitzgeralds barely rock up. And when they do rock up, it's like, you're here, no way. Well done. It's like when a child suddenly cleans this room and the water walks by it and it's like, <laughs> wow. Husband, husband, come up here. You need to see this. Your son, your son is cleaning his room. We have a miracle. <laughs> That's literally, there was one point I was reading the War of the Ro sorry, not the War of the Roses, the Hundred Years War, and I was skipping through the book because I was looking for the Fitzgeralds and the Fitzgeralds mm. finally rocked up like halfway into the book. And when they did rock up, that was literally the reaction of King Edward III. He was like, wow, <laughs> you, you guys have rocked up for the Hundred Year War. It's only been going on for a hundred years. Well, it <laughs> hadn't gone on for a hundred years at that point, but the way he was <sighs> talking, it may as well have gone because the Fitzgeralds were completely abusing their relationship with England and barely rocking up when they shut up. So their whole contacts with the Lancaster, um, I keep getting mixed up between them and the Lannisters in Game of Thrones, but the Lancastrians, <laughs> my brain was about to say uh, Lannister, and I was like, no, Lancastrians, we're talking about uh, War of the Roses here. And um, so their relationship with the Lancastrians was absolutely diabolical. So when Edward York comes over to uh, Dublin, straight away the Fitzgeralds are up there going, hey, how are you keeping? I know you haven't seen us that much, but... Or your biggest fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the big problem with, for the Kildare Fitzgerald, of course, at this time was the, um, the fifth Earl of Kildare, whose name I think was Gerald. I, it, it gets very confusing at yeah, this time. Yeah. But the fifth Earl, he died without, uh, I don't think he had any sons of any kind, but he did have a daughter. Mm. And the daughter married uh, as the second, uh, so as, as his second wife, uh, James, fourth Earl of Ormond. Mm. So another Butler <laughs> Fitzgerald marriage. Under the laws of the day, not, I think more like two thirds of the land of the, the Fitzgerald Earls of Kildare went to the Butlers yeah. through this marriage. So you're mm. you're kind of going these Fitzgeralds having uh, won awfully back in the 12th century, having taken Kildare uh, through various nefarious uh, means, um, have mm -hmm. now lost two thirds of their, their 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 thing. And worse than that, as far as I know, or as far as I understand it. The heir to the estate, which is like a nephew of the fifth earl, grandson or son of the sixth, but he is actually raised in the Ormond household. So he's basically a hostage. Mm. He's got very few lands. He's a hostage basically of the butlers. And the butlers are going, no, 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 it's fine. We're just keeping it in trust for you. <laughs> We're making sure your dad doesn't ruin everything. Well, this is So it's a complete disaster. And this guy, Thomas Fitzgerald, is, again, he's the father of the great earl of, of Kildare, but... For me, it's Thomas, the father of the great Earl, who is the greatest of them all, yeah. because he is such a talented guy. Well, that's the thing. Um, and we started this this sort of Kildare, uh, um, Ormond rivalry and everything. You know, the main, uh, sort of manners of Maynooth and Rathmore and Kildare, that, that would be the focal point for these two families. But this is really the start of that sort of rival view, because we we got to remember there are multiple reasons for these feuds um and they are all centered around many things um land inheritance being one of them but this one this sort of land kildare land would really open up after um you know when henry the seventh sort of takes over um in the in the in the sort of middle of the 15th century so yeah it's uh we started that you know that really is just like a uh in fact i believe and I don't want to go too far ahead, but the Duke of York wrote a letter 
saying that basically this rivalry about the lands of Maynooth and Rathmore and Kildare have been more destructive to the county than any Irish clan, than any mm. uh, English rebellion. It, it just been, and that's how bad it got. <laughs> that's, this is, a, this mm. is how. <laughs> so, the, the, you know, we, we sort of, uh, you know, I, I said earlier about the Renaissance, and I was trying to refer to basically those families in Italy, the Medicis and Massimo, princes of Rome, the Massimos and stuff, where they would meet each other in, with their feathered caps and their rapiers in the in the streets of Rome or Venice or whatever, and you know you'd have a bit of a brawl, and then they'd go off and almost like the don't bite your thumb, me sir, no, but I bite my thumb, sir. But okay, <laughs> oh, uh, we're talking uh, Capulets and Montagues. I, and... I was going to say, uh, I'm going to make another second reference to Leonardo DiCaprio in the Romeo and Juliet, you know, and. Uh, <laughs> So You're obsessed. Yeah. <laughs> He's so dreamy. Right. But uh, yeah, it's just um it's lo- get lost in his eyes. Yeah, uh, that's exactly it. But this is the thing. It does go that says, but at the same time, on underpinning all these sort of, you know, families is this this feuds of that are ingrained and it's hatred at some points today, you know, rather than just uh trying to make yourself look good in front of young ladies and stuff. Um, it really is brutal at stages. Um but yeah, this is this is um, uh, obviously both sides, different sides in the uh, War of the Roses and uh, Battle of Pilltown. Oh. Yeah, I suppose I suppose really to say is that the Fitzgeralds, having got back their lands after the death of the fourth Earl and his second wife, mm. the Kildares mm. actually start to stabilise. But obviously, they see what the Butlers are doing over in England, and they think, "Oh God, well we can't just let them. They'll." fly away with this thing if, if we don't um if we don't do something so the kildare fitzgeralds they make a pretty effective pact with the duke of york uh who's come to yeah, ireland did. i think is it 1450 or somewhere around there so he's he comes to ireland as Lord there, yeah. Lieutenant, and he is so he's you know pretty much the most powerful man in england other than the king yeah and uh so he's uh it's that's, that's how that came about as well um yeah, you know kildare's here and he owns land and me so they're pretty pretty close by yeah because at the time in england england is starting to fracture because the uh english king at the time he is the son of henry v but his mother's side they all have mental problems like the one king thinks he sees a bear a uh, bird the other one's in and out of a coma so that whole line is kind of having mental problems and of course henry the sixth has taken on this mental problem and he's one of the lancastrians and so while he's having mental problems and stuff, the man who thinks he's the rightful king of England, Edward of York, is suddenly getting support amongst his own um, allies in the English court. And it's all people are, you know, the dramas happening behind the scenes and stuff, stuff you would have seen in the TV show, the Tudors, you know, that kind of people scheming behind the scenes. And so everybody knows Edward of York is scheming. So um they're like, we need to get rid of Edward of York. So they sent him over to Ireland. Um, he's also, Edward of York has also inherited uh, Trim Castle as well at the time. So um, the Fitzgeralds and the Yorkists, they team up because the Fitzgerald, they, if the Yorkists don't like the Lancastrians and the Lancastrians and the Butlers are best friends, well, that means they can become best friends with Edward of York. So while Edward of York is over in Dublin, it happens they become to buddy buddy. <laughs> And it's they very old, sorry, go ahead, sorry. They start to make agreements as well that the because at the time they had the statutes of Kilkenny, which kind of restricted um, them being able to hire um, Gallo Glass and Kern and stuff. Now they were hiring Gallo Glass and Kern anyway. You know there was no problems. But what the Fitzgeralds wanted it was it to be legalized. And furthermore, um, the Fitzgeralds also want, uh, wanted Ireland to have its own coinage as well, to be able to produce its own coinage. So throughout the War of the Roses, here, there, and everywhere, you'll see Ireland suddenly producing its own coins. And the reason for that is since the end of the Scottish War of Independence, um, England has gone into Irish banks and just taken the money out physically. And the reason for that is because, well, just so there was more money in the English banks. But what that happened in Ireland then was it left Ireland more depleted. So when they wanted defences or to be able to build castles against the Gaelic, the money wasn't there. So they um, own the, the, you know, the, Ang- the Normans basically had to produce their own defences, produce their own money. 
So that this is what was causing them to become more independent to Dublin. And so overall, they wanted, if England kept taking money out of them, they wanted to cut that off by having their own currency. And so, apparently, you know, one of the things that Fitzgerald's, you know, backing with the Yorkists was to have their own currency and have the right to be able to hire their own man, Gallo Glass and Kearns, which is quite interesting in itself, against the butlers who wanted to keep the old system because the butlers were happy out going between England and Ireland. For my, my view, also maybe, like, maybe. Uh, no, no, I completely agree. I think that the, mm. the that that sense of they, you know, the, the the government in Dublin and Dublin basically, you know, the government of Ireland basically only covered Dublin. The mm. Dublin government there relied on one of or more others, Desmonds or Kildares, to help them yeah. establish rule because they could they just couldn't feasi- feasibly. Govern Ireland without the control of one of these these families. Well, yeah. Um, mm. In this book, sorry for cutting you off again, there, Michael. In this book, it says during the War of the Roses there were only seven, 70, 70 men on guard in Dublin. Seventy men, which is funny so because any time. I was just saying it's funny because you had the lands of the O'Burns and the O'Tools of Leinster literally mm. was yeah. right in the Dublin. They literally, and you every die, like, single the time, yeah. Yeah. every single time that happened, the Fitzgeralds had to quickly raise an army and march over to Dublin. It wasn't until the Yorkists had taken over, and I know I'm jumping slightly forward after Piltown, but it wasn't until after when the Yorkists had taken over England and stuff, and they let the let uh, Kildare Fitzgerald pretty much run Dublin. That Dublin was able to build its own proper, re- you know, um, I can't remember. It's not called regiments or anything, but you know, build its own armies to be able to defend. Yeah, to be able to defend Dublin against the likes of the Burns and stuff. But before then, it was quickly the Butlers and the Fitzgeralds trying to raise up their levies and just send them and off as quick as they could because they. There's uh, also just well. I've... Um, you're talking about the money being taken out and they're, you know, forcing, uh, basically impoverishing these, you know, uh, Anglo-Norman families. We actually start to see a wealth mm. in Gaelic families as we start to see, this is the rise of, during the War of the Roses, of uh, tower houses being built in Gaelic lands. Yeah. So, you know, there's almost like uh, another resurgence happening there of the Gaelic families becoming more powerful. They're pushing right up to Dublin. But this is a natural progression. They're still reading stuff, but this is not something that's been like a, a massive push by all the families to sort of a, it's just as the Anglo and English side are, are starting to, it's more English now, it's rather than Anglo. Um, this is the start of English nationalism, really, um, after the Hundred Year War. But the, you start to see these sort of families bleeding into the territories of um, the uh, families of Ormond and, and Butler and uh, uh, Fitzgerald and stuff. But we also start to see the families within these territories being a bit more rancorous and a bit more rebellious with the O'Connor Feelys are massively raiding, just going everywhere during the um, War of the Roses. And they are basically right in the middle of Butler territory. And they're smashing into mm. Meath against the old English families. Basically, it's just doing what they want. And that's how how they don't have a group. The English really do not have a grip of Ireland at this stage. And it's almost, mm. it's almost like forgotten about during the, the War of the Roses because it's almost like if we can secure England, we can just go back across there and sort that out afterwards. That'll be easy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, Henry VII didn't find it too easy, but his son, his oh, son. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I think... I don't know. It's I, I think it's more of a case of, well, we have, you know, for the Yorkist side, we have the Fitzgeralds. And the Fitzgeralds were pretty much freaking securing it for us, and vice versa. The Butlers, sorry, not the Butlers, and Castrians have the Butlers. So whichever side they're backing, they're like, well, once we're done, as you said, they're fighting in England, then we can financially support that other family that's in um, Ireland. And that's pretty much what they ended up doing. Like, Yorkists end up winning in the end, and that's who they straight away, going into the Battle of Piltown, that's who they support straight away. The Yorkists are already sending over whatever they can. Uh, finance and resources over to support the Fitzgeralds and the Butlers, they have no backing, you know. And you you can see what happens in the Battle of Kiltown, you know. Yeah, it's it's a weird one because obviously the Butlers, as we were talking about, they are the head of the family is now solely in a, in England. Mm-hmm. He's actually appointed one of his uncles, this uh, Sir Richard, actually a cousin called Edmund MacRichard Butler, this Gaelicized warlord who's a cousin of the Earl of Ormond. 
He's in charge of the Ormond lands. Now, he struggles his entire life to make sure that even Kilkenny stays under Butler control. So the Kavanaghs are, you know, into Carlow and into Wick, Wick, Wicklow and Wexford. So they're, you know, basically, we're not, the Butlers haven't lost the territory to the east of themselves. You know, Arklow falls to the um, to the Kavanagh family. In the in the west, mm. in Tipperary, basically all those lands are, are gone as well during this period. They fall to the... Um, the O'Kennedys and sort of the vassals of the the, the old vassals of the the O'Brien family uh, in the south, the, the Earldom of Desmond. Actually, we should probably say about that. That's actually involved in a pretty severe uh, civil war because the you know you were talking about usurpers earlier on. Mm. A usurper is basically taking the title of Earl of Desmond. The actual Earl of, Earl of Desmond is, has taken the sort of the lead from the Butlers and has gone over to mm. to France to fight for uh, Henry V back in the 18, or the fourteen twenties to try and get support to take back the Earldom of Desmond. So Desmond is in a bit of a turmoil because of the you know antics of the Fitzgeralds themselves. Um, it's it's very but they're still you know they're still finding the time to definitely raid Butler lands because <laughs> you know that's what one does. Um, <laughs> so it, it's it it's 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 a bit of you know the Butlers have actually their their territory is actually basically Kilkenny now. It's not. Tipperary, it's not Axford or Wicklow or Carlow even. It's it's very much uh, concertina down. So um, yeah, uh, uh, the but the real weird thing is that the Kildares don't actually get involved over in England. They they go, oh yeah, good luck guys. Yeah, good luck guys. Yep, good luck guys. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, but, <very> um, <laughs> they're they're not involved in England. They they just they're they're building their power. They're rebuilding that power that they had lost. When the fourth Earl of Ormond was in, you know, without equal in Ireland, mm. um, it's 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 then, of course, we, you're talking about the Battle of Titan in 1461, where the mm. Lancastrians, having looked like they might actually be on to a winner, mm. really dropped the ball. And Titan mm. is an absolutely colossal Yorkist victory up in Yorkshire, and um, the the Lancastrian army is basically completely and utterly destroyed. Queen. And Henry the F Henry the Sixth flee into Scotland with their son, their one son, Edward of Westminster, and mm. the Earl of Ormond, the, the this Earl of Wiltshire, the this anglicised, re-anglicised <laughs> Irish Earl, has he flees off towards Cumbria, presumably trying to get either to Scotland or to Ireland, and he's nabbed mm. and brought back to Newcastle, and he is beheaded, and he's beheaded yeah. because he is one of the most hated Lancastrians of all the Lancastrian lords he ranks as one of the most hated of the, of them all uh, because he had basically massacred uh, there's a town down in Berkshire called Newbury and he had massacred that town either the year before or the year before that and so in 1461 he's beheaded because Newbury is one of the Duke of York's estates and he's basically made a name for himself as uh, conducting massacres um, which mm. is which is it's not good. No, not too um, Anyway, the Earl of Ormond is now, yeah, the Earl of Ormond is now dead in 1461. His two younger brothers, he has two younger brothers who are, yeah, they've been raised in England as well. You know, they're they're basically Englishmen. You know, that's not divided up. They're basically mm -hmm. Englishmen. They probably speak English rather than the Irish. Maybe they have a bit of Irish. But they're foreigners in the land of their birth, really. And um, mm. they uh, go to Scotland initially, but then they realize that, you know, it's kind of expensive to live uh, in exile yeah. in the court of a Scottish king, and it's not bloody nice either. No. So they they <laughs> decide that they're going to open up another front. They're going to try, uh, they'll go to Ireland and open up another front against the Yorkist rule there. And so they come back and they, um, yeah, 1462 is a, is a pretty tumultuous year for Ireland. They land back in Ireland, and of course, you know, people don't know them from Adam. This uh, Sir John Butler is the oldest one, the heir to the Earldom of Ormond, but he's been attainted and, and his lands and titles are forfeit. And his younger brother, Thomas. And uh, so they they really rely on this cousin, this Gaelicized cousin, Edmund McRichard Butler, to uh, to help them out because I don't, I, like this is maybe, I think there's a PhD in this, by the way. Mm -hmm. But the, um, the, the I don't think that the, the Butler, Earl of Ormond, I don't think he has as much. He, he commands as much authority and 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 loyalty from the people of Ireland as does the head of the McRichard Butler family. Now, mm. I think he no. really relies on Edmund McRichard Butler to sort him out with troops and 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 you know sort of go. Oh no no, listen to John. Now come on guys, listen mm. to John. He's got yeah. something to say. Mm. So 
you know, blood being thicker than water and all that, Edmund probably goes, well, yeah, he's my overlord, he's my cousin, you know, mm. got to do what he says. Mm. Yeah. So anyway, they go off and uh, here's where I, what I did, I couldn't find out. I did quite a bit of research into this bit and I couldn't find out, do the butlers take Waterford because it's a Lancastrian town and it's just, they actually invited in or do they take it by, you know, the old besiege and wait for it? No. Um, that was the, it was actually the um, people of Waterford. So the people of Waterford, <laughs> this goes back to politics again. Uh, the people of Waterford were against New Ross. And so the people oh. of uh, Waterford would continuously get support from the English crown. Um, and the reason why they were actually against New Ross was the wine. Um, New Ross and Waterford had a very long rivalship against each other over the French wine that was coming in. And they wanted trade rights over it. So what Waterford did was they made this. You, you can go if you've ever been into the medieval museum of Waterford. It's the very fi- last thing you'll see. It's this humongous letter to the uh, kings of England. And it basically and they sold them all together. Uh, they put them all together and sent it to. I think it was the last one they sent it to was probably Henry Tudor or something. I can't remember. I actually cannot remember whatsoever. But they send the letter anyway over to the uh, various kings of England and they're basically highlighting every single great thing Waterford ever did. And of course, at the time, the Lancastrians were in power. So the butlers knew when they marched down every single time during the War of the Roses, they actually, because it's not just once, it's a few times during the War of the Roses, Lancastrians go to Waterford before they go anywhere else. Because straight away, they have support in uh, Waterford because... The, the last kings of England, Lancastrians, had supported Waterford, so vice versa. Uh, Waterford wants to prove that they were the ultimate loyal family to the king, you know, the true kings of England, which were the Lancastrians at the time, against New Ross. Because, you know, of course, New Rock, Ross would support somebody like the Yorkists, not like us. So obviously, when the butlers came over, um, they were just pretty much invited in. Okay. But vice versa, when the Fitzgeralds, every single time the Fitzgeralds come down, They'll close the gate straight away during the War of the Roses, and you have this long siege that kicks off, that turns into a stalemate. <laughs> and uh, so, the, is that the, so? Yeah, okay. The, the the Earl of Ormond, this Sir John Butler, is is in Waterford. He's pretty much popular there, presumably. So then, why yeah. does he go <laughs> out to fight at Piltown? I can't find a good reason for him to go out of why Waterford. Is it just that? A, is it just to defend Waterford from? Uh, I, I don't like know. I didn't even like question that. I actually, I actually, I actually don't. I don't even know why. I actually, I know that you question it. Yeah, it just seemed like a tactical disaster because I mean, you can't the, be that sure. confident, can you? Yeah, yeah. This sounds like a complete tactical disaster. Uh, well, I'm just thinking out loud here, but is it because that the Desmonds obviously, when the Butlers arrive in Ireland, the Desmonds finally get their act together and go, "Well, we're not having that. This is not." Um, we don't want the Earl of Ormond. It's bad enough having Edmund McRichard. We don't want the Earl of Ormond too. Yeah. That's dreadful business for us. So they send an army down to the, the Shure Valley towards Waterford. But the butlers come out to meet them. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, was this kind of, you know, in the 14th century in France, the Chevauché, where they go and they just tear up everything from horizon to horizon, basically. And I wonder, mm. that's the only thing, I'm, and I'm thinking out loud, that the Desmonds were doing so much damage to South Tipperary and South Kilkenny, that the butlers just had to come out to meet them, because next Copy. stop is Kilkenny City. Yeah, because they have um, Kilkenny. Yeah, because Kilkenny is more important to them as the butlers. Because remember, the powers isn't it? The powers are in Waterford, so the powers mm-hmm. are grand. But if the butlers lose Kilkenny, uh, that's their main base of operation yeah, where they get their yeah. finance, so on and so forth. So that's a really good point. Um, you did catch me off guard there because I, ca- I kind of was reading through this stuff but never actually questioned it. Now you got me really thinking. It's just um, one of those things which you kind of yeah. you could kind of overlook is the fact that you know oh but but you know, the butlers have got the butlers have got one of the biggest cities in Ireland, a walled city. They're safe enough, safe as houses. But you know, of course, that's not the whole story. What, but they do come out of Waterford. They do meet the Desmonds at Piltown, and I think probably would have gone rather well <laughs> if not for. <laughs> Certain circumstances, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I read like even because the the problem you're so right, like because 
it, it makes no sense for them to gallop out and just take on the Fitzgeralds. Because even coming to the end of it, when Henry the Seventh is sending troops over to Ireland, um, as Michael was uh, saying last time, um, the Fitzgeralds, um, even coming to the end of the War of Roses, are so their armies tearing into seven thousand. And given that the normal army in Ireland is about 120, um, the Fitzgeralds are terrifying. They are really terrifying with 7,000 troops on the field uh, throughout the War of the Roses. And so it makes absolutely no sense to me because like Henry VII pretty much at the end of the War of the Roses, instead of committing troops like his son Henry VIII does in 1534, he's able to send troops over just to give a good smack to the Fitzgeralds. Henry the Seventh at the end of the War of the Roses can't, you know, all most of his large armies have already been spent, and so when he does send an army over, it turns into a stalemate because, as you were saying there, the first thing the army does, it goes over to Waterford, the Fitzgeralds come over, they siege, and they turn it, it turns into one big massive stalemate. Um, so it may Butler, who, uh, the Butlers who have a way smaller army, I, I don't know what their numbers are, but I assume it's about 120, something I like mean, that. I, one of the it makes reasons, no sense to me. Like one of the reasons, though, is um, the Desmonds have failed to attack. Wasn't it before the Battle of Piltdown? The Desmonds had attacked Bedford and Tipperary, and they were pushed back. So maybe, um, yeah, there was a oh, Hackett, something Hackett. Philip, it was Philip Hackett. <laughs> Uh, repulsed an attack at Feathered and um, in Tipperary That's against the Desmond Army. Right, yeah. So maybe he's seeing this army is not as well, even though well equipped, or you know, maybe it's uh, they just see it as all the gear and no idea that you know the Desmond Desmond Army, you know, well well armed, but they not they haven't proven themselves to be an effective army. So um, mm. I can't remember if it's before or after. So, but if it is, if it's before, my idea would be well, if they were repulsed before, they can be repulsed again. So that that, yeah. that would be my sort of uh, sort of uh, interesting piece on that. Yeah, yeah, maybe he was thinking uh, that. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm mm-hmm. now wondering why the Fitzgerald killed or the Kildare Fitzgeralds didn't come down and help out as well. well both, maybe it was a t- just one of the things. Both both families were uh, you'd already touched on it there, but both families uh, were having major problems with cadet branches the upstarts mm. at the time. Um, the Desmonds definitely were, um, and Kildare, I'm sure. Um, we're having the same problem because the butlers again you had the mcrichards but we're forgetting all the other cadet branches that existed at the time i mean by this stage it's uh, you know i don't even know i wouldn't even start to count and uh of varying degrees of power but uh all vying for for sort of you know uh, using this terminus time to sort of rejostle their position within their societies yeah. i mean the butlers i suppose you're talking about the Dunboyne branch in Tipperary in North, sorry, mid mid Tipperary. You've got mm-hmm. the Lismallans up in North Tipperary. You've got the uh, Cahir or Care butlers down in the south. And you know, from their point of view, the McRichards are just another branch of the family. You know, they're just another minor branch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they they've got the support of the Earl of Orne, but they're just you know they're just one of four minor mm-hmm. branches. They control Kilkenny mm-hmm. Castle, but they're still a minor branch. So I see what you mean by that. That's a that's a really interesting point, and I'm going to have to build that into my <laughs> yeah. thinking. For that, yeah. Yeah. We, we often yeah. forget. We often forget the branch below them, the landed gentry of these sort of branches mm. that are pushing for power in their own lands. You know, this the Cahar branches have got to turn round to their second cousins and cousins and in who own large estates. Okay, they're not landed in the same way that we would perceive with the castle and and everything else that comes with that. But they are still they still hold vast territories you know hundreds and sometimes you know thousands of acres of land mm. they are still prominent in their towns as mayors i mean Hello, not Paul. only do the butlers and i'm sure the Desmonds do have pub town rights so they own entire towns and i don't mean in the sense of like they own the land the houses are built on they literally own these towns and they literally run the everyday run so these minor branches are effectively to the if you want an example of our mayors and stuff like that so uh, and are able to gather uh, local militias and uh, etc. So these, okay, they have their lords and the rank and the ladder, but these are these are still prominent people pushing for you know these are prominent businessmen. They're mer- they've got merchant lines now. They've got all these who hold the money, and this is where it is. And they're all jostling for power at the lower level, which obviously domino effect. So it's definitely yeah. Um, you know, like I say, these are there's thousands of butlers. Well, there's thousands of Desmonds, and they're. They're all 
landed sons of landed sons to a certain degree and they're but they're all yeah. still vying for to go up another level so it is definitely it's a, uh, isn't it? yeah it's, it's, it's fun, definitely a fun time to be medieval era you know, it's, it's happening all over western europe as the end of feudalism you know we're starting to uh, see a lot more um which same as Scotland a lot more the second sons are being sent off to become merchants and stuff um, and uh, really there's a whole dynamic change from that feudalism to sort of more you know we're starting to see Early the land of gentry becoming poorer so um, because of all these wars oh. and and the land's being divided but amongst sons so they're looking for other avenues of of income so they're pushing their sons mm. into other avenues with that comes second sons being richer far more powerful in the local politics of the world now I turn around to their other brother and go in mm, should you really be running the family farm of a thousand acres you know <laughs> you know so it's it's it is a is a is a really really fun time to when you start breaking down the levels of these sort of families yeah and that just shows that the level of competition that these men that we're talking about who led these armies and the what they're having to be up against at the same time you know this we talk about these families like they're behind them they've got this massive support and that's why they're able to achieve these things. But the fact they're able to actually achieve these things when they haven't got that support really does show why we still talk about them today. But I think yeah. I think uh, we might have to just uh, to, to wrap and pull into the quickly get into Henry once Henry the Seventh sort of takes over and gives Kildare, and uh, you know, um, we, yeah, we might finish up with Henry the Seventh there, and then um, we could always do a second part with a the two part. <laughs> yeah. yeah, something something on that t- lines. Because the yeah. yeah, I think the end of um, the war is so like they win Pilltown, but then there's a slight conflict between the Yorkists and the Fitzgeralds when Desmond Chew- sorry Des- Desmond Fitzgerald is executed on behest of the uh, Queen of York. He's executed, so it causes a break between the Desmond Fitzgerald Time. and the Yorkists after his execution. What was he doing again? I think he was I mean, the, Gaelic. I can't remember what it was. Interestingly, it, that, that, that guy, the, the Earl of Desmond, was actually preeminent at this time because he, um, mm. obviously the butlers, they went into exile in Portugal and France and didn't really return until 1471. And even then they were still yeah. trying to rebuild their, um, their, the, you know, when they, even when they got back their lands in England, there was this other branch still in Ireland, still doing the same thing, uh, being Gaelic warlords. The McRichard Butlers, but the, uh, the the Desmonds they had actually become pretty powerful under the the the, the York the the House of York and particularly under Edward the Fourth. I think mm. um, I think your people still talk about why there was this break between the House of York and the House of Fitzgerald because in 1468 both the Earl of Desmond and the Earl of Kildare were arrested at a Parliament in Drogheda. The Earl of Desmond yeah, was immediately was executed, one. and. I, I, I still can't get my head around why this happened because it is seems like the stupidest thing to have done to have destroyed. My presumption is um, that they wanted to English power above the Anglo-Irish power, but they couldn't. They still couldn't rule Ireland without at least one of these houses, mm. and they mm. they made an there enemy was, of one, the one that was in there yeah. on the up. There, there's some very good theories in this book. Uh, one theory I did like was the fact that I think it was political because the Fitzgeralds were rocking up into the English court and pretty much doing whatever they wanted because, um, what was it, Edward, is it Richard New York? Edward, I think it was Edward New York, uh, of course. He was buddy-buddy with the Fitzgeralds. Like, he was super, like, one of the boys. And the Queen at the time didn't, she, she is literally recorded as not liking his change of attitude when the... Uh, especially Desmond Fitzgerald rocks on in because Desmond Fitzgerald, when he walked in, he was a playboy for the English court because he had just won the Battle of Piltown. So he could hype. He was one of the only people there, like in the English court. So he could hype it up as much as he wanted. You know, I killed a billion men that day. Ha ha ha, la di da. And he would often go up to um, Edward of York and just have a laugh and a banter with him because he was one of the boys. And mm. the Queen didn't like this and wanted to get this because she literally refers to him in notes as an Irishman. And this isn't from a nationalist point of view. She literally refers to the word, and not just her, pretty much everybody, including Henry VII, when they're saying Irishmen and they're referring to the Fitzgeralds, 
they're mean, meaning barbarian. They're not saying it from a nationalist point of view. And then when the likes of herself and Henry the Seventh say Englishman, they're not saying it from a nationalist point of view. They're saying civilized. So when he, they're referring to Desmond Fitzgerald as Irish, they're calling him barbarian. The, the barbarian has come into the room. He speaks this barbarian ba 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 language. Um, he jumps onto the table. He does all this mad stuff. And that's the way she looked at it. So when he's arrested, I, I'm sure he gets him. He, he's done for st- behaving Gaelic. It was some Gaelic law to do with the statutes of Kilkenny that she ha- that he had broken, and that's why he was executed. And Desmond mm-hmm. Fitzgerald was targeted on that, and that was on behest of the Queen. That's the theory that's brought up in this book, and I kind of wow. I, I think that theory kind of fits in for me because th- I was exactly the same. I was going through various sites. I was reading what happened and I couldn't find this answer until I read the book. And then I was like, right, that's the only thing that comes closest. And as the book highlights, that's just the theory that the author has looking at the higher hard facts. Of course, if anyone else has any other theories, we'd love to know below with nice comments, especially for me, myself, because I love the War of the Roses. So I'd love to know what people's feedback is. The um, Yeah, it's a very interesting one. Obviously, that means that the Desmonds are now, for the next sort of 50 years plus, they, they're just like, guys, we do not trust England. We do not. Perfidious yeah. album that, or Albion, that whole a- area is just, you know, it, we, we they can't be trusted. Uh, we, we're we not going to send our sons to England, you know, like the butlers have been doing several times by this stage. Uh, they mm. they just said, we're not sending our kids to, to, to England to be killed. They have no trust in the Dublin government. They are now, they really pull back to, um, to, to, to Munster, the Desmond Fitzgeralds, and really pull back away from the English court. They had, we're now seeing them become more Irish than the Irish themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they yeah. wear Irish dress. There's, there are certain period times they go to the court and they don't even speak English. They, they can't speak English. They are yeah. very much invested in the Irish way of things. What does that do in Munster? Well, they, they become that kind of, uh, if, you, if you if you picture they they're kind of a roving court going around Munster exacting tribute from all their vassals, you know they're 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 promoting people who um, you know like the Gallowglass families that are coming down and they're they, I think yeah. they have a standing army of something at like a thousand men at this time and presumably that's Gallowglass. Yeah, oh. yeah, the, yeah, they did. And, have a standing um, the McShees were total, a big, big family for them. There. Yeah. In total, yeah. the numbers are given are 7,000. So they would have had, uh, in total, when they raised all their levies up, they had uh, 7,000. However, they had a continuous standing army of 150, which for the time, and given that like a regular um, clan at the time would have had 20 to 150 or 200, right? That's when they raised all their levies up. The fact that the um, Desmond Fitzgeralds were able to have continuously have up 150 on their land, and these are trained professional gallow glass in Kearns. It's terrifying to all the other clans. The other clans are like, whoa. Yeah. They walk into Kilmalik, and there's a gallow glass man fully trained waiting for them, and he's there all year round. And that image yeah. to the other clans is like, whoa, do not mess with the Fitzgeralds. They're on call 24 well, 7. If like. you look at the castle records of Ireland and Scotland, and uh, well, I don't know about England, but you're you're looking at the records of who's man in these castles, and you're literally looking only about six or seven men in each yeah. of these castles, if they're manned at all. You know, people yeah. have this assumption when they look at a medieval castle that it is armed to the guilds with men all year round, full standing army. You know, whenever an army advances over the hills, it's like right behind the gates, there's an army here waiting for. Them. But it's not. It's such a small contingent of. But, you know, and it waxes There's and we into one, history, but... Here, here's one for you, Michael. During the Hundred Year War, um, there were castles in England manned by only two people. Mm. Yeah. Two people were inside the castles. Yeah, yeah. Like that, I have this that picture of that film, The Lighthouse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, have more, I have more a picture of the Holy Grail with the three French soldiers on top of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, but it is it you know? I I laughed at that when I first was a kid, but as I realised as I got older, it, it is very true. You would only have three men, sort of. But at these, you know, you'd have your sergeant, maybe depending on the size of it, a constable, and you would have uh, maybe a longbowman and an armor or someone to keep stock a check and stuff like that. So, um, apart from yeah. the odd sort of young lad whippersnapper in the area who would sort of be runners and stuff. So. But yeah, these these castles were were so undermanned. Um, 
And mm. because most of the time, the same castles were the ones that got attacked. You know, it's those wee tower houses mm. and their smaller castles were really last line of defences. If you had to divert yourself from a retreat or something, you'd end up there. But they were never really yeah. continuously attacked. Or and the, these can hold out for for you know a couple of weeks without um, you know, needing to be fully manned. You know, you've we've got stag mm, locations. Oh, yeah. But yeah, so um, that was just uh, an interjection there. <laughs> well, I, I was going to leave. I think maybe we're, we're talking about where where we are, and in this we're now in the fourteen seventies. The butlers. Earls of Ormond had kind of re-established themselves over in England. Mm. Uh, they had completely lost control of their territory in Ireland to this McRichard Butler family, who were sort of, again, normally tipping their cap and, and saying, yeah, 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 we'll do that, never doing anything that the, uh, the Earl of Ormond says in England. They're just too far away. So the, the Butlers uh, in Ireland are led by this McRichard Butler, this Gaelicized family. In Desmond, as we know, we've just heard that they're they're kind of in in, in a bit of tumult or turmoil, mm -hmm. uh, a, you know, having pulled back to their own to their own territory. The Fitzgeralds of 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 Kildare, having been on their arses a few generations before, have now really established themselves under because of their link to the the York Crown. In 1478, mm. the man who we now know as the Great Earl uh, Gerald Fitzgerald, Eighth Earl of Kildare. Yeah comes to the uh, to, to be uh, in the you know to be Earl of Warm or Earl of Kildare and he yeah. is he basically in, in 1478 he says I'm the Earl of Kildare I'm also the Lord Deputy of Ireland Edward the fourth says no 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 you're too you're too young you're too inexperienced he sends across an English lord to take his place and Gerald just says nah <laughs> nah not yeah. happening sends him back to England takes the Lord Deputy for himself for himself now we have the Kildare's very much unassailable at the top three of Irish politics at the mm. moment. And mm. uh, I mean, if you wanted to pause it there for maybe what's yeah. coming next. Yeah. Well, I think we're about to hit really the cream of the crop of the way this rivalry goes and the wars that we end up having here. And it uh, really digs into sort of how ingrained this has become uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as two factions against each other. Um, and not only that, obviously, the two two lords, um, uh, the sorry, Lord uh, Kildare and his troubles that he was having with the old English families that weren't listening to him around this time. Mm. So the other sort of things here. So I think this is a good sort of uh, build up to Stop what point. really yeah. the next episode will. Honestly, I can't wait, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so, so uh, we'll leave it there. Um, um, for today and uh we'll uh I'll let philip close down and see you all soon <laughs> yeah guys thanks very much for all that as always to subscribe we will have all of butler's books uh down in a nice list or we'll have it at the side depending how good uh, michael's editing is <laughs> oh we'll just have it there <laughs> <laughs> as always guys <laughs> thanks very much for watching this show oh and make sure you subscribe over to can clans and dynasties over to michael uh, Michael, and you've taken on a lot of humongous. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I keep forgetting about that. You've got the old YouTube channel, lads. Get over there and start subscribing. Jesus. <laughs> um, Michael, guys, huh? what projects do we have coming up? Oh, what videos I, are we going on next? I am talking about a family, the O'Burns. Another another oh. family close. Oh, to... yeah, it's actually one of so, my favorite ones. Yeah, they 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 sort of. Uh, it actually they got put, bumped up the list when Rue made a comment on the video, and I thought, well, while I have been talking about the butlers, I don't normally stay within one county. I like to move it around so that everyone gets equal spread. But I just thought to myself, for two reasons: one, they were recently talked about with Rue, and two, I recently found out that uh, my closest genetic link on DNA is to the O'Burns. So I thought to myself, it'd be a good way for me to actually get into their history. As I've always immersed myself in Doyle history, so um, and I thought, well, while I'm doing that, I may as well make a video. So, O'Burns, so the next one's coming out. Yeah, I, I love the O'Burns, yeah. especially the right, oh, especially yeah. how they helped uh, push out uh, Richard II and stuff. So, I'm really it's looking just, forward to that with the old tools. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for Fee McCuber, and I can't wait. Follow me down to Carlo, you know, yeah. put that down in there. Oh, it's uh, um, just. Just as you know, fighting in, in the hills against the English, the, the tactics he used—it was mm -hmm. just you know—he was that. He's an interesting mm -hmm. character. He could be a video all on himself, like 
Um, Absolutely. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so that was me. What about you, Rua? What's in the pipelines? Tell you what, I, I have been sort of very, very busy of late uh, with work work. And then this is sort of trying to happen. Uh, this is the one I, I watched the series, The Boleyns, A Scandalous Family on oh, BBC yeah. One. And there were a few things at the start where it was talking about the butlers and how the butlers and the Boleyns were, um, you know, interlinked. And we've actually been talking about one of those people uh, that would link to the Boleyns, Thomas Butler, the youngest son of the fourth Earl of Ormond today. And I realized that I didn't know how that came about because it seems so inexplicable that the Boleyns, a English, Norfolk, uh, you know, very pretty minor merchant family, how did they marry into the butlers who had, you know, at this stage are, and I hesitate to say this because I am one, but mm. are a major player on the international, not just mm. the national, but the international scene as Earls of Ormond, you know, 7th Earl of Ormond, one of the most, the oldest Anglo-Irish families that there, there is. How the hell did the Boleyns manage to get into bed mm. with the butlers? And, um, you know, historically, the butlers are not very difficult to get into bed with. So uh, <laughs> yeah. I thought that was an interesting uh, interesting one to look at. So well, I, that uh, should be coming out when I get the chance. Yeah, I uh, no. well, we're sort of touched on it earlier, so it uh, we can uh, it'd be good for you to expand on that. So right then, well, I think that's us, isn't it? So uh, yeah, all right then, guys. Thanks, thanks very much. guys, very much.